Anyways, a lot of special things are coming up. A guest uh, next week here at 6.30. Uh, that's a security company coming to visit us. Threat hunting workshop in the daytime on November 6th also, which is free, and I highly recommend signing up. I'll be there. It's downtown of San Francisco at 8.30 in the morning till 3.20 or so. Um, CCDC is the defense competition, and we are doing very well. We have a good practice environment now, and people are practicing on Saturday mornings, and anybody's welcome there. Um, you can practice defending networks, and pretty soon we're going to be doing attack and defense there. If we got the network set up, I think in about two or three weeks we'll be able to do our own attack and defense. Uh, this Saturday we have a normal practice, and a week from Saturday we have a real competition, so it should be fun. And uh, Pacific Hackers is a DEF CON type conference, a small one coming up, and you can get in for free with a promo code I can give you, although I shouldn't broadcast it to the whole world. But, if, but anyway, you can get in for free, talk to me about it if you want to go. It's down in uh, Sunnyvale or someplace down San Jose area. Anyway, we're up to malware behavior. And uh, so there's a lot of categories of typical behavior you'll see in your malware. So downloaders are a little thing which then downloads a big thing. This is very common if you run a metropolitan payload in Metasploit. It is staged, typically, which means there's a small thing which runs which downloads the big thing. That's typically what you do because your original foothold is something like a buffer overflow that only lets you put in some small amount of data, like maybe 500 bytes. So you can't put a really big, complicated piece of code there. You put in a small thing that will connect and download more later. Most malware comes in stages. Um, so if you're using the Windows API, you'll use an API call like URL download to file or one of the others, and then win exec to run the file. And the, then there are launchers. Now a launcher is something that gets malware on the machine and runs it because you may not want to do something as direct as download an exe file directly and run it because that might hit the antivirus. And when I found out about this in the Violet Python book about four years ago, I started sticking sneaking malware past, any, past virus engines and it was extremely easy to do with this technique. You download a file that has the binary malware in it, but it's not executable in its original form. It's in a resource section. It's treated as data so that it is not interpreted as an executable, and then you just write a program that will copy it in another section, call it in exe, and run it. Uh, you can do that in Python, you can do it in any variety of languages, and the antivirus scanners will fall for it, because they do not find an executable in the format they're looking for it. Um, so then there's backdoors. Backdoor is basically anything that gives you special access to a system. Um, one of my servers was hacked about five days ago, and I, I went on and he, and found what he did, he didn't do much. Created a new backdoor account, though, commonly create another account to get back in. So I deleted that account and kept going. It's my attack server, so it's always infected. It's the zero trust model, so I didn't bother to do much cleaning. I just fixed the problem and keep going. Because everybody has shells on my server anyway. This guy got root, though. So I did the stuff he did as root, changed the password. We'll see. They come in There's plenty of ways to get root, too, by the way. You can all get root, get extra credit. My servers are intentionally vulnerable. But most people don't make it all the way to root. The projects I've written up do not take you all the way to root. However, your typical OSCP training should, getting to root on any of my attack servers is not that difficult because they're not that up to date. You have to keep the kernel up to date if you don't want people getting root. If your kernel's more than six months out of date, there's a bunch of known ways to get root. Anyway, so backdoors give you some way on there. Typically, they communicate over network traffic. Um, if the cheap, sleazy ones will use Telnet or something, uh, it's better to use Metrepreter or HTTPS or something that's encrypted. Then people can't just see what you're doing in the network traffic. And this will give you the ability to run commands on the server, or manipulate the registry. Typically, use reverse shells. You can make your own reverse shell if you have command line. Um, you have your attacker listens on a port, and on the target, you execute a command that will phone out to the attacker. And this is the command line way to do it, which is the simplest way to do it. There are plenty of other ways. You can do it in binary with Metrepreter, MSF payload. You can do it with Python. You can do it with PHP. There's many, many ways to do it. Somehow you run something on this that phones out to the server and then gives it a command prompt. And this is the old-fashioned way to do it with NCAT. This became so popular that people now have deprecated this version of NCAT, of NetCAT. This is the Windows version, NCAT, but there's a NetCAT tool that used to be able to do this, and that's now considered with the dangerous option turned on. This feature where you connect to a server and then execute a program and give that server control of the program is considered too dangerous and no longer included by default in Linux NetCAT installations. Anyway, but there's plenty of ways to do it otherwise, and that's, that gives you a shell up here. So you just listen on port 80, and then somebody connects to you, gives you a prompt, and now you're, on that, you're running, controlling that server. 
That's a reverse shell, which is what almost everybody uses because of the Windows firewall. The Windows firewall is a firewall that makes you a client only. So you, any unexpected traffic from outside cannot get in, but you can request anything and then it can get in. So you know, I cannot send a request to your machine and take it over. I have to get your machine to contact me and then it will work. That's why one of the things we're doing at CCDC is learning to do the opposite, where you set your firewalls so they will only accept out incoming traffic and they will not let you send any outgoing traffic, so this won't work. Because on a client machine, like a laptop, your firewall should be set this way because you don't want to offer a service to anybody, but you want to be a client. But a server, like a web server, should be set exactly the opposite way, so it is only a server and cannot be a client. And that will stop this kind of malware from working. Anyway, so um, that's your basic reverse shell. You can do it in Assembler or in the API. You create a process, and then you specify the parameters of the process create a network socket, tie the socket to standard input and standard output, and then it will take data from the network and feed it into that program, like CMD. That's how it typically runs. And you typically, of course, run it with an invisible window so people can't see what's happening on the screen. You could make it multi-threaded if you wanted to, so it can handle many connectors, although I'm not sure why you'd want that. Or maybe for a complicated botnet of some sort. Um, Oh, this way you have two threads. Okay, this is fairly common. You have one thread for one-way traffic and another thread for the other way of traffic. I've seen quite a few shells that work that way. You can, there are many different ways to do it. And there's remote administration tools, which just give you all this in one package. You download a big binary and let it run, and it then gives you many of these things here. Um, so you'll have clients all over the place, and you're, you're, you'll have a... Um, control servers that are telling all the clients what to do, issuing actions. You're typically making them all attack someone with a DDoS attack is a common thing. That's why you want to have thousands of infected machines. And Poison Ivy was one that was commercially sold and constantly updated, and then the author got a lot of legal threats and finally quit supporting it. But it was one of the popular rats. You, these things are not exactly illegal. I mean, you can buy them to monitor your kids' phones and stuff. These remote access tools have some degree of legal value, and some people market them as tools for bosses to monitor their employees' work computer, and other people just mark them directly, market them for criminals to use, and whether it's a crime or not is just very unclear. Uh, they will be taking your advertising and trying to decide if you were intentionally participating in a crime or if they were abusing it. TeamViewer, for example, is marketed as a legitimate tool to offer remote support to things, and it's in a lot of malware, too, because you can totally take it and put it in malware, and it's there you seem to be accepting that it's legal. This is why, you know, when I got in this business, I tried to establish a prominent position as a known ethical researcher because you, nobody's really sure whether what you're doing is legal or not. It basically goes on your reputation, whether you're generally regarded as a good guy or a bad guy. Speaking of which, um, I'm blocked now by Virus Total <laughs> a little bit. So um, the, my website uh, had some demonstration from four years ago of one of these reverse shells on it. And it, after four years, somebody finally noticed and put me on a blacklist. And the smarter antivirus products don't care because they're smart enough to know that it doesn't matter, I think. But um, some of them are catching on. I noticed there was five when I tried this earlier. My website is now flagged as malicious by five AB engines. Ah, but now it's zero again. It was five this morning. Maybe I spelled it wrong. I did spell it wrong. Okay, that'll do it. Um, so if. All right, uh, come on, stop messing with me. Okay, URL, yes, okay. Because I can't post Twitter links to my website anymore. I have to run it through China URL and then Twitter will post them. So exactly what's the benefit of that, I don't know. Okay, maybe I spelled it right this time, info. There we are, five people don't like me. Um, so I, th and I think it must be coming from Spam House. Spam House is famous for this and the uh, Yandex is basically an extortion racket. I mean, they will email you and say you got junk, you got poison on your website when you totally don't to try to get you to pay for their service. Um, but Avira is more or less real, and Malware Bytes is, is their MBAM tool is quite good, but of course they are very vigorous about removing things that no one else would call a virus. That's their main product, is they remove pups, which other people don't even recognize. But anyway, some people are getting mad at me. I found some stuff and took it off my website like a few weeks ago, but at the, my impression is it will take them four years to notice that also. So anyway, that's. That's good, clean fun. Speaking of your reputation, so, yeah. Is, is the rat uh, in, the, in the client side? Is what? Is the... Oh, rat, rats, yes, you have to install them on the client. And there's also a server engine running to receive the traffic. So the client can control the server? No, the server controls the clients. That's why it's, this diagram is sort of funny, yeah. 
I don't know why they draw it this way. How does it all work? Um, it's just like my interpreter or anything else. It's malware on the machine that restarts every time it reboots, and it phones home to the command and control center, and then the control center uh, tells it what to do. Perhaps they did it this way in order to show you that, of course, the traffic comes from the inside out. So from a strict networking point of view, the command and control center is the client, and the infected laptop is the server. It initiates the communication. But from a functionality point of view, you would consider it the other way. So it's kind of like a reverse shell kind of thing? Yes, yeah, like a reverse shell. That's the idea. So you almost all have to work by reverse shells because of the Windows firewall. And if you disguise the traffic so it looks like HTTPS or DNS or something, then the corporate firewall will let it through also. That's why you typically don't. Early stuff ran on a stupid port like 31337 or something. All the modern stuff disguises its traffic to look like some normal kind of traffic because otherwise you'll get blocked. So you have a bunch of zombies or bots controlled, a botnet is something that controls many hosts. Rats are typically one by one. That's why they're like team viewer. They're not intended to control a thousand machines at once. They're intended to do support on one machine. But of course, you can easily use them for other purposes. So rats are intended for targeted attacks, and the botnet software is the mass attacks. Anyway, then there's credential stealers, of course. Things that will try to steal the credentials off your machine. One popular type these days is Android apps that are poison that steal the stealing data off phones is much more valuable because most Banks use two-factor authentication, but if you take over the phone, you get both factors, because you can steal the SMS messages in addition to the website traffic. So that the two factors is reduced to one factor. Anyway, so one thing you can do is run a keylogger or something, or a screen capture that sees when they log in and steal their credentials, or you can get the stored data or log the keystrokes. These are all various ways to do it. So uh, there used to be a very handy tool for this that Microsoft provided in Windows XP, because Microsoft, um, has the usual problem, which is they want to add dangerous features. And they usually just jump right on that, because any feature that will make more money is worth it and to hell with security. Um, although, to be fair, they try to make it secure. But the point is here, they wanted to allow you to have third-party logins, because everyone's getting fed up with passwords, especially mobile devices. So why don't you log in with your thumbprint or your face or your voice print or your any blood pressure or anything they got? And so they wanted to have a general system whereby you could make devices that would plug in and now become your authentication. So that's called GINA, Graphical Identification and Authentication. So what you can do is um, this msgina.dil will load uh, the WinLogon, which is the process that launches to catch your credentials to launch Explorer. Explorer doesn't happen until you log in. WinLogon will load MSGina. And MSGina will then load third-party customizations because, of course, these strange devices you're using to log in might also need special drivers and software. So you're really asking for it. I um, uh, thought I had another slide added here. Anyway, it'll show up. So now you when log in loads MS Gina, it was then loads this, and in this malware, this was it, they had this thing called FS Gina that was loaded, because all you have to do is put them in this registry key, and that lists all the additional DILs that are loaded in order for the authentication to come in, because when you install your thumbprint reader or something, it puts stuff in this registry key, and that tells it what other DILs must be loaded for this thing to work. So all you do is put malware in that key, and now when it's trying to log in, it will load the malicious DIL, which can do whatever you want, and so that will pop up. Uh, now, the, uh, the malicious DIL now has to export processes, export um, functions that override the other functions of the real DIL, so that when the real authenticator tries to call something to find out, is this guy authenticated, they're getting a poison thing. All these things start with W1X. So one way to spot it is to look for a funny looking DIL that exports W1X functions. That's MSGNA. And that's the game. So here's what the Trojan would look like. It would, of course, do a simple calculation and most of the time just call the real function. So, no, so that whatever your normal login process is, it works. But under certain conditions, it will then call other code. This is how any properly designed rootkit works. You arrange to mostly work normally and only for certain conditions implement some extra code. And so at two, what it does is it logs the credentials. So this one didn't even interrupt or let you in. What it did was it made an extra copy of the credentials. I set up one of these on my server a while ago. I haven't done it in a while, but I thought it'd make a good project, maybe in this class, I don't know. You can, you can watch SSH brute force logins. It's very easy. If you just set up a server in open port 22, you'll immediately start getting people to find a login. And what you can do is you can recompile open SSH with this kind of Trojan so it keeps a log of all the passwords that come in. And it, you, wait, lock, try and, and you totally harvest the passwords and watch them go by and see what passwords people are using, and it is pretty interesting. 
it's very easy. And in fact, now everybody's got cloud servers in my 123 class. For Google, it would be very easy to just install it on there. Maybe I'll put it in as a project. The only thing that is annoying is it has to be port 22, so you are not going to be able to SSH into port 22 yourself anymore. So you have to move the real SSH to some other port, and you have to remember not to log into port 22 or it'll log your password. Mm -hmm. And I did lose one of my cloud servers completely by attempting to move it over and fouling it up so I lost all access to my server because I thought, well, I'll upgrade the certificate authentication too while I'm at it. Then I'll be really safe. And what happened is I locked myself out of everything. So I had to rebuild the server. That's the kind of thing that happens. But you know, you'll learn. But anyway, Gina is gone. This particular technique has been deprecated by Microsoft. They moved beyond it. Now they've added something called credential providers with a bunch of these credential providers registry keys and a new system, and it, of course, is also vulnerable. And there's a more complicated process of exploiting it written up at this link where this guy did it. By uh, changing the values in those DIL, in those registry keys, he was able to add a second set of credential providers. So when you log in, there's two sets of buttons, Tyler and user and another Tyler and user. These are the real ones that go to Windows. These are the fake ones that go to the malware. And then there's another file you have to adjust to hide one of these. So they see only the set of buttons that go to the malware. And that, so he was able to accomplish the same result on Windows 7. Um, and there's a, a, um, a blog out there showing you how to do it. Anyway, because Microsoft still has the same functionality, of course. You can plug in funny ways to log in. And of course, that's right in many ways. That people have all sorts of use cases where they don't want people typing in passwords. Increasingly, people are trying to get away from passwords. And there's hash dumping. You remember we've done this in plenty of the classes. You use some tool like King, you can totally dump out the hashes. Your machine does not store passwords in plain text. It stores them as hashes. It used to store them as these horrible LM hashes. Now it stores them as these upgraded but still horrible NT hashes, which are now only one million times weaker than Linux hashes instead of about a million times weaker than that. And so there they are. And so the past, these passwords are capital P at SSW0RD, and that's why your name and your name too have exactly the same hash because there's no randomness in it because Microsoft never got the memo from 1975 when Linux figured this out. Um, but anyway, at least the password is not readable. It's hashed with this glorious one round of MD4 hashing system. And so you, if you can steal those hashes, they're quite useful. You can often use them as is without cracking them as tokens to log into domain controlled systems. That's called passing the hash and that is pretty scary and outrageous and sort of like Tesla that says it's perfectly fine that your car rams in a wall. Microsoft always says that's perfectly fine. We don't need to do anything about it. As 15 years, everybody just passes the hash and they say, this doesn't seem right. <laughs> Microsoft keeps saying, it's fine, it's fine. The manual says it's fine to be that way. We're like, this bothers me. They're like, well, shut up. It's the way it should be. Well, anyway, you can crack them offline also if the password can be on a list of stolen or guest passwords. And there's various tools out here which will steal those hashes. Yeah. How oh, so is the PASA, PASA hash that works? You can do it with Metaspoint, and it's, it's in my 124 class. You just harvest the hash, and then you send the hash over the network as an authentication token, and it just takes it. Because they, and Microsoft's defense is they must have a single, uh, if you're going to have um, single sign-on, where you sign into one server, and then your credentials are accepted at another server, there must be a token. And for the token, they use this or Kerberos, and in both cases, you can just steal it and reuse it. So they, it seems to me like it would be awfully easy to just have a challenge response system where the token is different every time and never reused. But somehow, they have not done that. I thought that was the whole point of Kerberos. But somehow, it has not happened. And this remains a problem even to this day. It's, it's a strange situation. But that's very useful if you want to hack into Windows domain net systems. And Microsoft has never found a way to actually address the fundamental problem here, where the same token is used for two purposes and reused later. The only thing they have done in the latest version of Windows is they've invented silos, so your high-privileged accounts can only log into certain machines. And their goal is to make sure you do not use a high-privileged token and log into an untrusted device, like a laptop that's browsing the web. So the tokens remain reused and unrandomized, but they are less likely to be exposed in the most dangerous area. For some reason, Microsoft is convinced but they cannot switch to single-use tokens, which is pretty baffling to me, because Google Authenticator and everybody has single-use tokens, but somehow Microsoft is convinced that cannot be done, and they will not go there. Yeah? So you just uh, send, the, send the hash to the server and then kind of lock in? Yes. Yes, and it accepts that as your password. But it's not inside you. It's not uh, applied to inside one machine, right? It's just a... Well, you can't log in by typing a hash into the password field. But you can log in and sending the hash over the network, which is weird. 
And it's been weird. This is the first big accomplishment of the Cult of the Dead Cow, like 20 years ago. This was their first tool. They wrote Loftcrack or Offcrack, which stole password hashes off the network and broke into Windows machines. And then they started passing the hash, and they started screaming at Microsoft as a bunch of idiots. And that was like in 1994, and nothing has changed. Well, things have changed, but somehow the fundamental sort of mathematical inconsistency has not changed. And so anyway, that's the way Microsoft is. It's handy for all its attackers. Um, so in order, the, what Microsoft does do is they make it hard to get the hash. Uh, they made it so even the administrator can't get the hash, only the system account can get the hash, which is not that hard to do. So what you have to do is you have to somehow elevate yourself to system. There are a bunch of standard ways to do this, and Microsoft does not seem to patch them hardly ever. Uh, so you can inject a DIL into the LSASS process, which is one of the ones running before you log in, so it's running a system. So you can add code to that to steal it, and that's one way to do it. Um, this is why the tool Kane used to be called Kane and Abel. Kane is the user land component, and Abel is the DIL that gets injected in to get the privileges. Then they decided to just call it Kane, but I think it still works the same way. Um, so PW Dump does this. It sticks a DIL into LSASS, which then calls get hash, which is a Microsoft API call, which gets the hash. And then there's PW Dump is another one that uses SAM serve to get there and gets to, now the hash is actually encrypted, but the, it's encrypted with reversible encryption and the key is in the system and there are various tools that can decrypt it. So, you know, it's all pretty silly. Uh, this is, I'll be here in a talk in a couple of weeks about cryptography theater. There's a lot of this. It's like people have a whole bucket with a hole in it. So the solution is to put it in a bigger bucket that also has a hole in it. This is what people do all the damn time. So let's encrypt it with a key and hide the key somewhere. There, now it's more safe. I said, well, it's not that much more safe. You know, there is, there are these fantastic things like public key encryption. There are ways to encrypt things where you really can't get in. But rather than use them, you just use a bad routine, another bad routine on top of the bad routine, another bad routine on top of the bad routine, and then you wonder why everybody hacks you. Anyway, um, so uh, here's API calls. So it's calling various dills. And uh, I'm not going to struggle with that one. But anyway, here's the pass to hash toolkit. Again, puts a dill in ASS to get the hashes using different um, API calls like enumerate login sessions. And this has the LSA function. LSA is a particular level of hell that also went down somewhat with Microsoft Windows XP. There's this thing called local security administrator, which has secrets called LSA secrets. And until Windows Vista, Microsoft would store a plain text copy of all the passwords you used in case you had to re-authenticate to some other network service. So they're like the last 10 passwords you used for any network service were just sitting in a thing called the LSA secrets. You could totally dump it with a bunch of hacking tools. And the original administrator password was just sitting there in plain text and it was bloody awesome. And somewhere around XP Service Pack 2, Microsoft finally cleaned that up. There's just an amazing number of things that just holds it just stay open for 20 years. Anyway, um, that's why you know hackers get this reputation. You know a few bits of lore that just go on and on and on. Most pen testers say it's like actually boring being a pen tester because you just do the same thing over and over and over. Then you come back next year and do it over again because they didn't patch anything from last year and you wonder, why am I doing this? Some people quit after a while saying they feel futile. And that's why I think I keep thinking more and more about management. The real value is not just exploiting holes, but learning how to actually fix them in the real world where you have management and financial considerations. That's the real problem. It's like, you know, doctors can say, don't smoke, lose weight, get some exercise, but that doesn't really help people much because telling them that doesn't solve the reasons why they aren't doing that. It's a much more interesting and much more difficult problem. Why aren't people doing that? And what could we do to make them actually do that? <laughs> anyway, so when you get over just hating people for being stupid, then you might wonder how you could actually fix them. And that's, uh, that's a more interesting problem. <coughs> All right, so which one is poison ivy? Oh. Poison ivy is a rat, remote access trojan. And which item puts malware in the resource section? Which is good, clean fun. All right, those are launchers. All right, which one causes the infected machine to send a sin out? Okay, that's a reverse shell, good. Which one is no longer possible? Gina, Gina is over. All right, and which one puts a dill into LSASS?
two of them. Hash to hash and PW dump both do it. All right. So let me record the winners. All right. So then there's key logging. Right, if you want to steal the keystrokes, let me see if I can get this zoom thing off the screen. All right. And, uh, all right. So if you want to steal the keystrokes, um, the most perfect way to do it, of course, would be the way the keyboard actually works, which is in the kernel with a driver, which acts as a keyboard driver, which steals them right there. That's, of course, the most difficult to install, difficult to remove, and most accurate. So that's like a rootkit style. Um, you can also do it in user space with the Windows API. This is going to be a clumsier thing. There was a student, uh, Ben, who put a lot of Python keyloggers on the machines in the lab one year and got a bunch of passwords. Uh, that's, you can totally just write it in Python and run it in user land, it's, and it's pretty easy to detect and pretty easy to defeat. There are even anti-keylogger anti software you can put on that scrambles the key presses and would defeat that kind of keylogger, although I don't know if it works well on the kernel-based ones. Anyway, so in order to pick up the key presses from user land, um, you can hook. Now, hooking is part of why malware is so awesome on Windows. There's a whole bunch of features in Windows where you say you do something normal, but you can put a mark here saying, before you do this normal thing, call this other code. There's a bunch of them, detours and all kinds of things, and hooking is one of them. So when it calls, it will have this hook function, which is all, now every time someone presses a key, be sure and call this other function too. And of course, the point is you might have a fancy keyboard with some fancy input that needs a special driver or something. So Microsoft supports this, call something extra every time it's time for a key press. And then there's polling, which is really sloppy, where you just poll so many times per second to see what key is down. And so you'll get like 10 events from an A because someone held down the key. So it's pretty sloppy, but you will find the keys. Um, I wrote a bunch of Android key loggers to steal passwords off Android malware, like hundreds of them. And some of them I had to do this way. You'd see like each letter repeated 20 times. Um, all right, then, then you can get an async key track. This will tell you whether each key is up or down. This will identify the foreground window, because another thing you really ought to be recording with your keystroke locking is which window they were typing into, so you can tell which one of these messes is actually their password and which mess is something else. So, you know, these are other API calls you'll see. And so you'll get, get log into a new window, then call this function and figure out what key to put there. When you've iterated through the keys, then you can go to the next key. Pretty clumsy. You go through the keys to see if a key is up or down or if a key has changed state. You know, these are real primitive ways to do it. And so you'll find the output will have strings of some sort. It's going to have to have an indicator of all these funny keys. And unless they encode it somehow, it might be pretty easy to spot. <coughs> um, then you've got to have persistence mechanisms. The point of these is to survive a reboot because people reboot their machine frequently. So um, these are the ways to make something run on reboot. There are many of them. Most of them involve using the registry. Um, and then there's other tricks. So the run key is the classic normal way to do it. There's a run key and a run once key, and there's two or three different types of run keys and different registry containers. Um, all these things are used during boot up to run all the things that are supposed to happen. And as you know, Windows it runs like 80 things every time you start it. There's a lot of things that automatically start, and you can totally add your thing here. Um, you can procmon, if you run it while infecting the machine, we did this way back in like the first or second project, will record all the registry changes. We had a, pro a project that looked like this. You run procmon, you run some malware, and you'll see it. Close key, query key, open key, um, query value, and create keys and such. You know, in this mess will be all the keys that are created. It's a very good tool for that. You can also use regshot, which I don't like as much, but it is cool. Regshot will take a snapshot of the registry, then you infect it, then you take another snapshot of the registry, and it will do a diff between the two. It just tends to create a huge, long text document, but it is another way to do it. Um, it's not that hard to detect this stuff, unless they also put on a rootkit that actually causes these tools to lie, which is in principle possible, but in practice rarely observed. Then there's app init dills. So everything that loads user32.dill is anything that is planning to interact with the user by putting up buttons and things to talk to them. And all that may depend on you having some goofy input device like a light pen or something. So they give you this place registry key to put dills in that should be loaded every time I have user interaction. And you can just totally add more things to that. So you can add extra dills which are in this key and will therefore load with every box that has user interaction, which would therefore include every all the secrets, passwords and everything going in. And you could just put your malware in the dill main function so your malware will run right away and your dill doesn't have to actually provide any real purpose, very real useful function at all. Um, then there's win log on notify. 
These will handle Windows login events, like login and startup. Uh, this is pretty cool because you can steal passwords from safe mode, because it has to use these functions even in safe mode. Um, and there's SVC host dills, which are most of the services running on your machine. Um, there are a lot of services, and there are just groups of services defined in the registry in these SVC host keys and service name keys. So if you're running in Process Explorer, you'll see all these SVC host things running. And if you hover over one of them in Process Explorer, it will tell you what they're doing. They're typically running 10 or 20 services each. So this is running Internet Key Exchange and Group Policy and Bits and Themes and all kinds of things in one of these. There's another SVC host elsewhere running more junk, and you can just add yourself to any of these lists where your malware is one of these things there by just putting it in the right registry key. That's the problem, of course, since it starts so many things, and Windows is the all-purpose operating system. They have no way to know that it's malicious. It could very well be that you've added some bizarre software or hardware that needs more services, and they'll just load it up. That's why Microsoft usually resists any attempt to make this process more complicated, and they say, we have to stop you from getting administrator on the machine. If once you've got that, we shouldn't talk about this anymore. And that's why they resist things like improving password hashes. They say, no, by the time you're there, we have already gone too far. We have to stop you from being administrator on the machine, because once you get administrator rights on the machine, there's just so many things you can do. Uh, network attacks are similar. They mostly say layer two is unsecurable. So you just have to keep them from getting layer two. I had a bunch of layer two attacks I went around and talked about, and people say, oh, don't worry, don't bother with layer two attacks. Layer two attacks are stupid because you can't protect people on layer two. And there's some truth in that, of course. For example, you can do art poisoning, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Therefore, you can redirect traffic or deny traffic to any machine you want. And it's hard to imagine upgrading ARP to something that would resist that. So what's the practical solution is you have to keep them off your layer two. And Microsoft's idea is they should never get administrator on your machine. Anyway. Here's the, uh, some of these keys. Here's the SBC host. Here's all these different groups, like network service and term services for terminal services and all this. And each one of them has a whole bunch of things it's loading. Then there's service dill. Uh, these, these things have parameter keys with a service dill value, and that's where you send it to dills that have to load with these services. And you, like I say, there's groups. You could overwrite a non-vital service with a service you don't need. A bunch of these services don't matter. Most of the time you can terminate them or you can just add another one and you can do it with dynamic analysis of the registry just looking for the registry keys that are getting written with Procmon or Redshot or anything like that. And writing to the registry is not a particularly subtle thing to do. All right. We've got another set of cahoots. It's which one runs as a keyboard driver? Okay, those are the kernel mode key loggers. Which one uses the get a sync key state function? That's a hooking. All right. I was going to get that wrong myself. All right. <laughs> no, you no, it's not hook. It's not hooking. It's wait a minute. I guess it is hooking. Okay, I thought user space, but so did you. Let's go back in the slides then. If nobody's getting it right, including me, it's worth taking a look at. Um, key loggers, okay, get async case tree is used by polling key loggers, it's right there. That's how it works. Oh, of course, that's how it does, it looks for each, each key is up or down and then sees if it's changed. Now those are, um, and that is a user space technique. So this is a very cruel function, but this is something you'll see on the search test. There are two answers that have some truth, but one is the most precise answer. Yeah? That's polling, not hooking, right? Uh, I think it is polling. Not hooking, oh dear. I think you're right. I think you're right. Where's hook, hooking's up there? Hooking is set, yeah, right, that's not hooking. So this is wrong. Even worse, I can't change it now. Oh. I'll have to, uh, <laughs> can let you me make it? I don't think I can, but anyway, I'm gonna make a note. That does seem to be wrong, hooking. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. I think you're right, that's just wrong. That's why these things are extra credit. Partly because you compensate for my flaws. <laughs> We'll just charge ahead. <laughs> That's how it works. All right. Which one depends on registry manipulation? Well, I've learned not to try to attempt fixing things like that right now, because often I'm just digging myself in deeper. Same thing happens in breach response, like something bad happens. Don't do just jump right in and think you're fixing it. Make sure you're not making it worse, because usually you are making it worse when you jump in to think you're fixing it. Anyway, um, 
So, right, well, they all depend on registry manipulation. Good, you folks got that. All right. And which one will record all registry mods? All right, procmon, that's it. And which one is loaded into every process that uses user 32? OK, those are the app init dills. So not a popular answer, but that one is correct. Anyway, so, uh, so you can alter a system binary. Instead of adding another dill and making it load, you can alter an existing one. Dills are typically what you do, so you take the entry function, like dill main, and you modify it. So it jumps to some other code, and if you don't want to get caught, you'll do the usual thing of then running it normally, so you don't break normal functionality. So here's the original code that starts doing stuff, and the this now jumps somewhere. And that will do something, and then reproduce the original code. That's the idea. Now, dill load order hijacking is a huge one. People have been using this for 20 years to hack into Windows machines. Uh, back in the early days of Windows NT, the original registry entry that loaded the desktop just said explorer.exe, and it did not have the full path. So you could just put another explorer.exe someplace, and it would load a different kind of desktop. And this is still how you hack in Windows machines in my 123 class by altering the thing that is for handicapped accessibility, the sticky keys thing. There's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of things that can load before you log in, and you can get a command prompt before you log in with system privileges and just totally hack into the machine. So um, it used to, this is the search order for loading dills. It looks for where the application is, then it looks in the current directory, then the system directory, and so on. And most people do load dills by just the name. Now, Microsoft, people are used to things like start, run, CMD. In case you're interested, starting around 2000, Microsoft documentation said don't do that. You should do start, run, C colon, backslash, Windows, backslash, system32, backslash, cmd.exe. Everything should always have the full path and because then this won't happen. But nobody does. Even programs don't. Even installers don't. Everybody's in the habit of just typing explorer.exe and assuming Windows will find it. But if you think about it, what it's doing is hunting for it. And it's hunting in all these directories for explorer.exe, explorer.bat, explorer.com. So you can make a companion Trojan by just putting something with a, a normal name in an unusual place, and it will often load. And this is how we nuke the isotope separators in Iran. This is one of the exploits of Stuxnet. I was on an airplane when I saw this, and I totally threw away my talk about it. At the time plane landed, I replaced it totally with a talk about how to do this, because it was awesome. And the USB stick had a dill on it which was equal to a system dill used to draw windows. So if you are stuck in the USB and the window pops up showing you what's on the USB you're already owned. You don't have to open a file or anything. Because they put a dill which was loaded from the dill directory instead of the real system dill. It was bloody awesome. And uh, Microsoft had to put a end auto run of, and end an entire industry. And that there used to be an industry of these keys that you would plug in, and then you get another start button on the right of the screen, and they call it, and you use those things, and they were all running on your USB stick, and they sold it as a security and privacy measure. There's a brand of USB sticks that did this, and you had your browser and everything on the USB, and they said you can use anybody's computer, you're not leaving any cookies behind, it's all safer, but it all relied upon automatically running stuff as soon as you plugged in the USB, and Microsoft turned that off. That was the end of them. And they didn't sue, like the antivirus companies have threatened to sue Microsoft for antitrust for making it so that they don't have viruses, say, to ruin our industry, which is a pretty strange argument. That you made a defective product until we're just addicted to making the fix, and we, you, we will not tolerate you fixing it or you're destroying our livelihood. I get the same reaction to people say, you know, quit making more robots, you're putting us out of a job. We have to go back to like shooing horses and having horses and buggies so we all have jobs. And I say, I'm, I'm not sure that's really the road to wealth, but anyway. Um, so that's the game. This is called Dill Load Order Hijacking, also called Companion Trojans. <coughs> and uh, in order to prevent this, Microsoft has a list of where known dills should be. So now, if it loads a common dill, it has kept a record of where it should be, and it will not just hunt all over the place for it. It will look for where it should be, which is pretty nice. But not all dills are protected by this. In fact, not all dills used by Windows system software are, in fact, protected by this. And this is something you really get used to. Every time Microsoft has a security measure, when you take a good close look at it, they only put in half of it. Um, so here's explorer.exe, lives in slash windows, it loads all these things, and it, a bunch of them, like this one, are not known dills. So it doesn't know where to find it, 
and it hunts all over for it. So you can totally put a malicious still in there. And this is, uh, if you do the exploit development class, we do this a lot. If you just look at every module loaded by a piece of software, several modules don't have the protections turned on. So, you know, it's just like any security guard. They lock half the doors and go home and say, I did my job, and the other doors are hanging open. And so it's not as good as it should be. Like Explorer.exe has 50 vulnerable dills. So, and on top of that, dills load other dills. So even if they protected the dills, there could be other dills they didn't protect. It would be a lot of work to protect all the dills, which I guess is why they didn't bother. But still, it's pretty easy to criticize them for this. Anyway, um, so you heard detectors for this. There's a thing you can download called the dill hijack detector. I have not tested it, but it's not too old. It's from SANS, so maybe it works. I don't know. All, it, this is apparently, this is what Microsoft should have done when they vote Windows is just write a program that will hunt for all the dills and find out where they are and then record where they are. How hard is that? Well, it doesn't look that hard from where we sit. If Microsoft didn't do it, it's probably not just that they're idiots, it's probably that it has con consequences that would hurt other kinds of software and stuff. That's the real problem at Microsoft. They have all this legacy code that they're addicted to. So they're like dragging all these anchors everywhere they go. So every time they do something, they don't do it all nice and clean. Linux people would do that, like especially Kali, where they don't give a damn about breaking everything. But Microsoft has a huge bunch of stuff they can't break. And so they always implement only a small fraction of it and they often have it turned off by default and all sorts of stuff like that. So privilege escalation is getting up to administrator from a local user account or getting up to system from an administrator account. And um, back in the days of Windows XP and earlier, everybody was just administrator all the time and browsing the web and everything. And this is one of the many reasons why Linux people sneered at Windows people for being idiots and insecure. And Microsoft finally wised up in Vista and made it so you no longer surf the web as administrator, which so now you actually have the job of privilege escalation required where you used to not even have to bother. So um, Metasploit has four or five methods building to it to escalate privileges, and for some ungodly reason, they keep working for years and years. It's like a lot of other things get patched, but somehow Microsoft does not prioritize these privilege escalation things, it seems. Um, so the user doesn't have all privileges, but there are things that require system privileges to do, and you have to get up there, and one that is the SE debug privilege is one of them you might want, and this is thing that we can be used to escalate to system privileges. Uh, back in the days of Windows XP Home Edition, all you had to do was open a command prompt and type at because the scheduled tasks um, ran with system privileges. So if you scheduled a command prompt to open five minutes in the future, it would open the system privileges. Microsoft figured that out and passed it around Service Pack 1. But anyway, um, so here is someone setting the access token to SE debug privilege, and so it's going to escalate the system. That will obtain an access token, which you can then attach to a process and have this privilege. Uh, we did a bit of this in the 124 class that's coming around next semester where you steal tokens and move them over here so you elevate your privileges up to there. It's just like stealing an ID and getting into a bar with it. It's extremely easy to do in the, with running processes in Windows, which is why if you leave a process running for something like log monitoring that is running with high privileges, anybody can just steal them once they get root on one machine. And that's why Microsoft's general solution is this um, siloing, where they just say all the high privilege accounts should only be running processes on the domain controller, nowhere else. So there isn't some something running on a louder machine with those privileges that can be stolen. Anyway, here's a just ship and token privileges to raise it to system. There are dills, there are functions for this, and you can use them. So then there's user mode rootkits, which are going to hide things, hide files, network connections, processes. Kernel mode rootkits are even more powerful. Uh, we talked about them before the SSDT hooking. Uh, but anyway, this is the user land. So you could change the import address table of an executable. It has this table. That's why you totally see it with things like uh, um, the things we used earlier in static analysis to just see these things, um, like PE Explorer and PE View. Um, so you can modify those tables. And then it will load different um, different functions and different dills. That's easy to detect. That's IAT hooking. So you have a thing called terminate process. And here's the legitimate program. And it has an import address table, which used to go to kernel 32 terminate process. But I modify it to have the wrong address here. So now it calls some other function instead of the real terminate process. So when you try to end something, like close a window, it runs the rootkit function instead which would be, for example, for a task manager, you can't destroy the process that I have running on your system. You try to terminate it, and it won't terminate that one for some reason. Then there's inline hooking, which is more difficult and more subtle, where you do not change the addresses. 
So you let this continue to go to the real Windows code, and you modify the code. So the real Windows code no longer does what it used to do. That means you actually have to understand the code and modify it without breaking it too much, which is more difficult. That's more advanced, but of course more subtle. All right, I think that's the end of this stuff. We got another Kahoot, and I may say something about the project, so I think there's not that much to say about these projects. Oh, I do have something I want to show you. It's kind of fun. So, which one puts malware in an empty portion of a Windows compound? Okay, that's the Trojanized binary. See, when you add a code to a binary, where do you put it? If you take, there are projects I added to this class this semester, which are you're hacking into um, Putty. And those come from some guy's blog. And if you read the original blog, I didn't go as far as he did, but he then moved, we made a new section and put the malware down there. But he then proceeded to maybe use a program to find code caves. It turns out that a lot <coughs> of people leave blocks of unused space in their binaries, like a thousand bytes or more, that in case of future expansion, so they could add more code. So you can totally put malware in there, and that's what they're referring to here. You find empty parts of a program and add the code. And if you click the links at the bottom of those projects, like 8A and 8B, you can get to the blog where he shows you how to do that. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go that far, so I only went like part way, but he went all the way. That would have been another project or two to find the code caves and put your malware in the code cave and then restore the full functionality of PuTTY so we didn't break anything. Now, the one I left was pretty messed up where PuTTY quit working, which, you know, is lame attacks, but that's as far as we went. All right, a registry key that prevents load order hijacking. Or at least it would if there were enough of them filled in. That's the known dills. Tells it where the dills should be. All right, which one has 50 vulnerable dills? Order.exe, all right. And the hacking tool that makes privilege escalation easy. It is remarkably easy. Like many things about Microsoft, it is very hard to understand why they are so slow to deal with these problems. <laughs> and which one changes function code and not pointers? Yeah, that's inline hooking. Good. Those are good answers. And uh, let me make a note of the winners, and then I'm going to show you something that I might put in this class. I'm, I don't know. I put it in another class right now. I've written up some stuff, which I put in 127 for the moment, but I might move something over to here because I have not a lot of extra credit in this class, and I have way too much extra credit in this class. But it's there for a reason. Because because of this class, I finally found out how to compile C on Windows easily with the command line version of Visual Studio. And so now I'm reproducing the basic attacks here. And I'll show you something pretty fun, which I haven't even formally written up yet because I'm still working on it, but it is pretty fun and quite on target for what we were talking about tonight. So I got three projects worth of this stuff, and let me get rid of some of these extra windows. Okay, so um, now we know how to make assembly code with simple command line tools, sort of like GCC. It's awesome. And so once you've got the build tools, you can make malware. So I've got a simple program here. This program has a buffer overflow. It has a main routine that calls something called test password, and this reads input from the user into a variable with only room for 10 characters without checking. So you can override it, and then it does some kind of math to decide if you're right or wrong, but it doesn't really matter what it does, because if we override it, we can change the return pointer to print you win, whether you won or not. This is from an old CTF, and it's the kind of thing, whoops, kind of thing you do to um, a simple test to see if you can do a takeover control of the machine. And so uh, you compile that thing, and um, if you turn off stack cookies with GS minus when compiling it, um, you can make a version of it that doesn't have stack cookie protection. So that's part of this to see the stack cookie protection. And stack cookies we talked about in the other class. Uh, this is what stack cookies do. This is the one. Um, yeah, this is the one without stack cookies. When you enter a function, it, the assembly code just makes a new stack frame, which means you save the old base pointer, you start the new stack pointer where the base pointer was, you subtract 14 from the stack pointer to make room for local variables, and that's what makes a new stack frame. And then you go in and enter password. But if you have the cookie protection, then there's an extra function when you enter and leave these things, and that should be up here someplace. Um, I may not find it handily here, but let me give it a try. And if I don't find it easily, I'll just move on to the next point, which is more interesting. But um, 
there it is. If you have the default compiler switches on in Windows, it has this extra action here of loading a security cookie from a data section, and then it puts it on the stack. So it's now the stack was 14 before, but now it's 18 because it needs to make the stack bigger. It stores an extra variable just to see if somebody's overflowing the stack. And this is called a canary in Linux, and it's called a security cookie in Windows, and it does prevent a whole category of buffer overflow exploits. So that's fine. So this defense is stolen straight from Linux. It's really quite effective. It's really quite simple. Um, and it uh, does get in the way. Now, another defense, however, is kind of famous for being lame in Windows, and it turns out to be lame in an interesting way, which is address-based layout randomization. So if you compile code in Linux and Windows, you can turn this on and off. In, so here's a simple program that will just print out the stack pointer. You can have inline assembly code in C. So this is inline assembly code that does one command. It moves ESP into a variable called data. Then I can print out that variable. That's all this thing does. So when you do that, um, compile that thing normally. Every time you run it, you'll get a different number. 8FF, 6FF, CFF. It changes because that's the whole point. Every time you reload a program, it randomly moves it in memory so that if you inject code, you can't find the code. And this was quite effective at blocking buffer overflow exploits. But you can turn it off. It's, and it's, if you want to turn it off, you have to separately compile and link. And then when you link, you say dynamic base, no. Then it will no longer relocate things. And so if you run the program, you will get the same value of ESP every time. This is the way everything was uh, up till Vista. In the world of Windows and around the same time on Linux, everybody started turning this thing on by default. So now you can make a program that doesn't have that. And when you exploit that program, it's very easy. So all you have to do is go into a debugger, like Immunity, or I could have used um, Ali. And when you debug it, uh, when it asks for a password, if you give it a password that's 32 characters long, it will overflow and crash. And you'll see the EIP gets HHHH in it. So some of those letters end up the EIP. So I can put any number I want in for the EIP. And all I have to do is look at the code and find the part that prints the message I want to print. So here's the part that prints enter password. And someplace down here, I find the part that says you win. And all I have to do is put that address in there, and it will print you win because the code does not move. So I can find that address, and it's a fixed value. So if I put that address in, I will then see um, it will run and say, you win. And so all I, you can just write a simple Python exploit that will do this, that just puts in, instead of the H's, it puts in that address in reverse um, in little Indian order. That's the typical buffer overflow exploit like Alice Null wrote 20 or 25 years ago. Now, if you turn on address-based layout randomization, of course, none of this will work. If you compile the program without turning off the randomization, then every time you run it, it has a different address. And then if you just run that exploit, it will just crash and pop up an error box because you're going to jump to some place which does not contain the code, and it will just hit some random junk. It's probably inside an image or something. It'll hit some junk which is not valid assembly code and crash. That's the point. So I began to wonder, since I can finally easily write stuff, and I can write um, little C programs and a little Python programs, I said, you know, I could test out this radar space layout randomization and see how cool it is. And I, I've, it motivated me to look up Microsoft statements. And Microsoft statements are pretty damn shocking. Microsoft apologized for the ASLR in Vista not being very good. So in Windows 8, they upgraded the ASLR. And this is the upgraded ASLR. Eight bits of randomness. 256 <laughs> possible locations. This is the upgrade. It's like mind-boggling Microsoft does this. It's like those NT hashes, one round of MD4. That is the upgrade. What they used to use was even worse. So that defense feature so if this means all you've got to do is run your attack 200 times and you'll get lucky. And even the high entropy one, which only applies for things above 4 gigabytes of boundary on big sets of machines or 64-bit things, is only like 131,000. 16,000 for Dill's like, who are you kidding? So I said, man, I didn't know it was that bad. But I thought it was bad because I started recording the ESP and just running the program over and over. And pretty soon I got the same value as my unrandomized one. Like after the first few hundred guesses, I said, hey. You know, I was just going to prove that even after a million guesses, you don't get it. And I just got it right there. What the hell? And so I said, well, let's see how this works. So you can uh, make a simple ESP program that doesn't wait, but just prints it out. 
That's all a shortened version of the previous one. And then you can just make Python that runs it over and over and over. All right, in Python, you can just import OS and you can execute a system command. So here's will run it five times. Uh, and so if you do, you'll get five different values. That looks pretty random. And so I just run it 10,000 times and stick it in a file. And then I read that file in and dedupe it in Python to see how many unique values there are. And it takes about five minutes. And the answer is 10,000 runs give you 6,900 unique values. 3,000 of them are duplicates. So that's not one in 256. I wondered if I was going to get a total of 256 values. It's not any of those numbers in the Microsoft documentation, which is the kind of thing you get used to. <laughs> a Microsoft documentation is sort of like political promises. It's as a vague passing resemblance to the truth and reality is always far more complicated. But anyway, then I'm going to make a vulnerable program. My plan is I'm working on this. I'm making a vulnerable program to put on my server with ASLR turned on, and you get to hack it anyway. Because um, it's, I'm in the business, of, I'm in the process of making that program. I'm going to put in a bit of an op sled in it to make it a little easier, but, but ASLR does not save you. Even on 64 bit Windows Server 2016, it is still lame and pathetic, which I didn't realize. Uh, the uh, documentation I read in another book said that there were 17 bits of entropy, so it would be in the 100,000 range. But apparently, it's not, not at all. It appears so. If I just put it on my server and see them students that write a program to try and attack about 100 times, they'll probably get in. And now I have a Windows cloud server, so I can set up things like this. So that's my plan. Anyway, um, I thought I'd found something new and exciting, but it turns out it's actually stronger than the Microsoft documentation said it would be. I just didn't realize how horrible Microsoft said it is. It is no worse than this. It's sort of like Tesla. Well, it says right in the manual. It'll plow right into a, bar, into a wall and kill you. So you have no right to complain. I'm like, oh, I feel like complaining anyway. But, <laughs> but the Microsoft documentation said it only had 256 values. So when I only had 6,000, I'm complaining. But they're going to tell me, what are you complaining about? Anyway, so that's it. I'll, I'll clean up and go to the lab and help anybody who wants to work there. <laughs>